Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for Fish and Richardson's webinar, Successful Strategies for Patenting Bioinformatics and Computational Genomics. My name is Peter Fossa, and today my colleague Patrick Darno and I will discuss the current state of patentability for bioinformatics and computational genomics technologies, some strategic IP advice uh, for companies operating in this space, and more. Our biographies, the presentation, and the New York, New Jersey blank CLE form are available for download on your control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Please note that you must be logged into the webinar on your device to receive the CLE credit. You will not receive credit for listening to the audio portion only. Today's webinar will run for about an hour and includes a question and answer period at the end. You may ask questions at any time throughout the program in the Q&A section of your control panel and then we'll do our best to answer all those questions at the end of the presentation, time permitting. Please also feel free to contact us personally after the webinar and our email addresses will be available on the screen as well. Also like to quickly mention our next upcoming program taking place on Wednesday, November 2nd, where my colleagues John Dragseth and Natika Fiorella will host the webinar post-grant for practitioners, post-grant appeals, and they will be discussing hot button cases concerning the substance and process of PTAB appeals at the Federal Circuit and provide some practical insights for your day-to-day -to -day practice. Before we get started, I also want to remind you that the content of this presentation is for educational purposes only and does not necessarily reflect the opinions of Fish and Richardson, not intended to address every court or case situation. Next slide. Just a quick background. I've been at Fish and Richardson since 1987 and focus on IP issues in healthcare and in particular innovations at the intersection of the life sciences, engineering, and computer science. Patrick Darno has been with the firm since 2015 and has a collective 17 years of experience in the patent field, having first worked as a patent examiner uh, at the United States Patent and Trademark Office. He was a patent litigator and now at Fish. He's a patent prosecutor with an emphasis in the field of bioinformatics. Also want to thank Sam Kim, one of our technology specialists who helped us with some legal research here. Next slide, please. Groundwork and giving a little bit of a definition since bioinformatics and computational genomics are such broad terms. Next slide, please. So how are we defining bioinformatics? It's a field of technology that uses computer science to understand biology. The, the computer science is used to understand uh, biology. It's, it's really a loaded phrase. What do, all, what do we mean by all those terms? In, in the most general sense, we're really talking about computer systems that analyze biological data, <clears throat> such as sequence information, which is, which is a huge problem because of the tremendous amount of data that's out there. And then if we get a little deeper, uh, can, computer systems can apply techniques related to, for example, data processing, mathematics, statistical modeling, physics, information engineering, or any of the myriad combinations thereof to analyze and interpret biological data. So it's really a broad interdisciplinary technological field. One example of a system is, for example, uh, obtaining genomic reads generated by a nucleic acid sequencer and performing one or more computational operations on the obtained genomic reads. Next slide, please. So computational genomics generally relates to using computer science to draw inferences about a person or animal based on a genomic analysis. That could be a partial genome analysis or a whole genome sequencing analysis. It's a specific subset of bioinformatics. As a result, the innovations in this field are directed towards computer systems and software that can apply techniques related to data processing, mathematics, uh, different algorithms, statistical modeling, et cetera, in combinations to analyze and interpret biological data. So this too is an interdisciplinary technological field and 
given the extremely large data input sets, unique challenges arise in managing and processing the large input data sets. Patrick's going to talk a little bit more about that as well. So for today's discussion, we're basically saying that these two terms, computational genomics and bioinformatics, are going to be the same because legally they're, they're really given a very similar analysis. Um, and just to keep in mind, bioinformatics may, but does not necessarily equal computational genomics. Next slide, please. I'm going to turn it over to Patrick Darno for a discussion on initial stage of patent strategy, defining boundaries of technology in a bioinformatics pipeline. Okay, with that, thank you all again for joining us today. And with that, we can go to the next slide, please. So when you start your initial stage of your patent strategy with respect to, to patent applications in this technology space, one of the key things you can do right up front is to identify what you're trying to patent, where it falls in the pipeline of bioinformatics inventions, and who would be performing those operations. And you want to, you want to craft your claims for those applications accordingly. So to, to start that discussion, we want to kind of, you know, give an example of a bioinformatics pipeline and, and kind of define it so that it provides context to the rest of the discussion. So a bioinformatics pipeline can comprise a device, software engine, or combination of both that performs one or more of these stages. It can include one or more operations to obtain or generate the biological data. You know, one example of, of obtaining the biological data or generating the biological data may include sequencing operations on plant or animal DNA to generate genomic reads. That is by no means, you know, limiting, though. You know, you may just have a, a database of prior biological data that was already generated that you just may obtain and process. Um, another stage of the bioinformatics pipeline may include what are referred to as secondary analysis operations on previously generated biological data. This can include mapping genomic reads to a reference sequence, aligning genomic reads to a reference sequence, or determining variants based on previously mapped and aligned reads. Um, and then once you have, you know, once you've performed an initial stage of interpreting the biological data, there may be more processes that you can perform on the biological data to learn something else. So now you have these variants, you know, the differences between a sample genome or sample reads and a reference genome, you might want to, what does that tell you? So you may perform post-processing operations referred to as tertiary analysis to maybe determine targeted diagnosis treatments or both based on those variants. Um, and, you know, below provides a diagram of an example bioinformatics pipeline. And then we're going to look at each stage of this pipeline and, and try to give you examples of what you can look for and what you should be thinking about when you try to patent technology in the space. So the next slide, please. So the key considerations when framing your patent strategy, you want to look at where your invention fits in such a pipeline and who is likely to perform those steps. Um, so with the where, when you look and you sit at your, maybe you have an invention disclosure form um, and you say, who's providing, uh, where is this technology being performed? And it may be, for example, sample preparation, sequencing, secondary analysis, or tertiary analysis. Each of those will be performed at a different stage in the pipeline. You may have other pre-processing operations or post-processing operations, such as formatting of reads output by a sequence or decompression of reads received by a network on the pre-processing side, um, or maybe compression of reads generated um, you know, by, by one or more stages of the pipeline for transmission. Um, and then once you know where you're at in the pipeline, you want to ask who is likely to perform that technology. Um, because, you know, one of the things that often comes up in bioinformatics inventions is the sequencing aspect. Um, somebody generated this data. But you have to ask, for example, would that person always be using the sequencing device? Would that company or entity always be using the sequencing device? Um, so when you're in this space, you don't just want to jump and include a sequencing step into your claims because the target of your infringement may only be operating on the sequence data and not 
doing the sequencing. Or likewise, the, the, the target of the infringement may only be obtaining a, a data set that has been mapped and aligned to a reference genome, uh, reference genome, or even just obtain a set of variants and determine a diagnosis or treatment. And then you might have other players, like a doctor, who just administers a treatment that another entity determined based on a set of variants. And it's very important to consider not only who is performing these operations in the present day, but who may perform them in the future. And the reason all of this becomes very important is because you want to try to draft claims that avoid divided infringement. Um, you want to try to draft claims that read on a single entity that is going to perform all the claim operations because it makes your infringement read easier. And, and it sometimes doesn't allow for any defenses uh, on the divided infringement front. Next slide, please. So the next few slides are going to be kind of quick hitters. They're more for reference than they are for us to go over every aspect of them here. But it, they kind of break down each aspect of the bioinformatics pipeline and describe what may be going on there and some things you want to be thinking about as you as you as you craft your claims on on the where and the who would be performing these operations. So one of the types of examples of inventions in this space may be sequencing inventions. These may include sample preparation, nucleic acid sequencing, quality scoring of base calls generated by the sequencer, um, and perhaps read data formatting that's going to be output by a sequencer. Um, data generated by a sequencing device is often used in bioinformatics inventions, but always ask whether the sequencing is where the invention lies. Um, oftentimes I've seen even very senior practitioners jump to put sequencing steps into the claims um, when, when it can maybe be a much more powerful claim to just have obtaining data generated by a sequencer um, so, that you, so that you don't require the entity to actually perform the sequencing um, because it may be performed, you know, the operations on the sequencing data may be performed at a server in a data center as opposed to the lab that may house, house the sequencer. Um, so next slide, please. So another type of invention that may arise in the bioinformatics pipeline is secondary analysis inventions. Um, these are typically a first stage of analysis performed on the output of a sequencing device. So you may be performing operations such as mapping genomic reads to a reference sequence, alignment of reads to a reference sequence, or determination of variants, as we discussed. And one of the things you want to be, you know, there, there's a bulleted list here of things you want to be thinking about as you craft your invention. You want to consider particularly the relationship between the secondary analysis engine to other stages of the pipeline. Um, you know, would the target entity perform secondary analysis? Um, would it perform, also perform the sequencing operations, pre-processing operations, post-processing operations, or any combination thereof? Um, where is the secondary analysis engine located? For example, your claims drafting may be very different based on whether the secondary analysis engine is in a server in the cloud um, or perhaps even in a sequencing device. Um, and then you want to talk about, you know, how the secondary analysis engine is going to, to output or transmit the, the data that it outputs. Um, and, and for example, is it going to compress the data before it transmits it? Um, and things of that nature. So next slide, please. Um, so another stage of the tertiary analysis uh, of the bioinformatics pipeline will be the tertiary analysis engine. Um, and some tertiary analysis operations may include determination of a diagnosis, determination of a treatment, um, or a combination thereof. And there are a variety of factors that can come into play here that you also want to be thinking about. Similar to the other elements of the pipeline, you want to consider the relationship between the tertiary analysis engine to other bioinformatic pipelines. And here's a series of questions you may want to ask yourself as you prepare your applications um, or frame your patent strategy as to you know, who you want to target, where your technology is being performed, and who you want to target. Um, so, you know, Tertiary analysis may be performed by the same person that generates the variants. It may be part of a package software, um, you know, suite that that obtains the variants directly from the mapping and aligning engine and performs the tertiary analysis. It also may be two separate entities, and and that may change over time as the technology evolves. 
Um, one example earlier might have a pharmaceutical company that may receive in the future a set of variants and create targeted and specific um, treatments based on the variants for an in, that, that an individual has between their se sequence, you know, their sample genome and the reference genome. But then they may transmit data describing the treatment or package and send a targeted drug to a doctor who would then administer the treatment. Um, so it, this brings up another another key thing to think about is would the person or entity or company performing the tertiary analysis actually administer a treatment? Um, a lot of times people may jump to put administering a treatment into a claim that may fall in this space and that can be very successful in overcoming 101, but it can also be very successful in creating a divided infringement problem if the person or entity or company performing the secondary, you know, the tertiary analysis processing is not the, the entity that is going to administer the treatment. So it's, it's, it's another thing to, to, to keep an eye on and, and weigh the benefits you would get in overcoming 101 versus the value it gives you in a patent claim. Next slide, please. So another type and an alternative or a specific subset of a bioinformatics pipeline may include computational genomics inventions. Um, and, and these will probably fall within a tertiary analysis type you know, environment because you've already got a generated entity genome and now you're going to analyze that genome and see what you can learn from it. Uh, so, you know, a genome for a human can be very, very large. Uh, you, you could be considering three, three billion nucleotides, and then you may have, depending on what is stored with the entity genome, if you have quality <laughs> scores for each of the three billion nucleotides, you may have a lot more data and any other metadata that is associated with that entity genome. So some of the things you wanna consider with these types of inventions is how are you gonna store the genome and manage that genome, how you're going to access it, um, how you're going to process data of that magnitude, you know, massively parallel processing of the data in order to, to increase throughput, um, are all the types of things that may fall within the scope of something and the computational genomics um, portion of a bioinformatics pipeline. Uh, next slide, please. So we talked about, you know, briefly in, in some of these pipelines, is precision treatment, for example, obtaining a set of variants um, between a person's genome and a reference genome, a known reference genome, and possibly even, you know, it, 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 in a perfect world, in a dream world, targeting specific drugs, maybe, maybe, maybe formulating specific drugs or treatments for a person based on those variants. Is that reality? Um, you know, there's volumes of sources that seem to suggest that that, that may be true. And that that may be on the horizon, and and um, you could easily envision a world where uh, your 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 sequence genome is part of your everyday medical treatment when you visit your doctor for your yearly checkups. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of you know a lot of thought should go into this because there's a huge field and and a lot of opportunity. And then it also begs the question of the the elephant in the room is is that what are you going to do with all of this data? So the next slide, please. It, and, and you have to ask, is it actually possible to efficiently manage all of this data? So with 7 billion people on the planet, plus their pets, plus sequencing for plants, um, and, and you know, with, with people, billions of nucleotides in each of their genomes, plus the associated metadata, this, you know, the field of bioinformatics and computational genomics is, is trending towards becoming one of the biggest generators of data in the world, um, soon to soon to displace entities like YouTube, um, which generates one of the largest generators in the world with all the video and content creation going on in the field of astronomy. And you know, we talk about the the, the final compiled genome for a person or or or, or plant, um, but you know, some sequencers are what are referred to as short read sequencers, and they'll generate not just one read for each reference location, they may generate, for example, a, what's called referred to as a polyp of reads, which may have 32 reads for a particular location, and then you determine 
the, the best read for that location. So the, the, the amount of the takeaway here is that the amount of data in this field is going to be growing perhaps exponentially over the coming years. So one of the things that you're going to have to consider to be a player in this field is the role of data compression and decompression in this space. And in forming your patent strategy on this, you want to consider innovative ways to make data genomic files smaller. Consider innovative ways to make compression and decompression of genomic data files faster. Um, and consider innovative ways to make compression of genomic data files lossless. Um, and then another thing you can consider is also is how's the data going to be formatted that enables either of the you know, either or any of the aforementioned improvements. Um, next slide, please. So the, the message here is to act now to ensure your company is not left behind um, with, with a wide open space um, and, and lots of room to grow. There's, there's a lot of opportunities. Consider current and future business needs. Does your company have a bioinformatics unit? If yes, um, take steps to protect the intellectual property. If it doesn't, start one. Um, and, not, and don't just think about today. So today, the reality of precision treatment targeted therapies based on your genome may not be a reality. But with a lifespan of 20 years, a lot of things may change between now and then. So think about where the technology is headed in the next 5, 10, 15, and 20 years um, and take steps to protect it. Be creative. Um, it's, you know, One of the exercises I urge clients to do is assume they have an unlimited team and unlimited budget to do whatever they want and you know assume you can do it and then file a patent application on it um, take a chance um, and you know it, it could it could pay dividends down the line next slide please so strategic con considerations can include a two-tiered approach um, the first tier of the strategic approach is the obvious one is to look inwards at your company's innovations identify streams of products that you derive revenue from and the, or that you plan to derive revenue from, and try to prepare and file at least one patent family for new and useful blocking features of that product stream. I'd refer to a blocking feature as something that protects the product stream that cannot be designed around. Um, and then think about the improvements to existing products and services, um, and try to patent the improvements. Um, you know, this this keeps your competitors at bay by stopping them from advancing on your disclosed work in your existing patent applications. And then monitor public disclosures of for all of your employees in the space um, um, and make sure you get in the disclosures before any such block blocking features become public to the extent practicable. Next slide, please. So this slide is, is not as obvious at the first. Um, and obviously everybody has limited limited resources and where to spend and where to spend those resources. But it's also sometimes very important to look at outwards at your competitors' innovations. Gather competitive intelligence on your competitors' products and determine key features of their products and services. Think about how they would improve their products and services and or the natural evolutions of their products and services and then patent it or at least try. Um, because if you do that and you're successful, you can actually strategically cut off the revenue stream of your competitors um, and, and, and help to build your economic moat around and in the technology space. Um, next slide, please. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Peter, who's going to talk a little bit about navigating the Alice landmines. And it's the first part of this of this of this slide section of, this, of the presentation, are bioinformatics inventions eligible for patent protection? Uh, go ahead, Peter. Next slide, please. So we, we captured in this slide the ALICE question based on the ALICE Corp versus CLS Bank International case from 2014, which was a Supreme Court case that really kind of started uh, the litigation attacks on software types of uh, patents. In that case, the uh, the Supreme Court created a two-part test saying they look at, in the first part, whether the claim is directed to a patent ineligible concept. For example, is it an abstract idea 
Is it a law of nature, a natural phenomenon? And if the answer is yes in part one, in part two, they look at whether the claim elements and the rest of the claim transform the claim into a patent eligible subject matter. And they're looking for innovative concepts. So before that, case in 2014, uh, very few software patents were attacked under Section 101. After that, there were literally hundreds and hundreds of cases per year. And as practitioners are, are getting better in drafting their patent applications in the first place, and, and Patrick's going to get into some comments on that as well, but the, the number of these uh, decisions where the where the patents are killed has gone down since 2014. So that's a good sign because that all is relevant to patents in the bioinformatics space. So the, the, the rejections that you typically see in these kinds of cases allege that a claim is directed to a judicial exception. So that's the part one of the test. And uh, we get that from examiners all the time. And as I said, bioinformatics claims and computational genomics claims are likely to be hit with those kinds of things because they're gonna say, A, it's, it's all software, so it's an abstract idea. That's almost by def definition, the examiners are gonna say software is abstract. Sometimes you get hit with both that and that it has to do with a law of nature because you're correlating some sort of an effect with particular data, which is a sequence sequence information, which is a, obviously something from nature. So the, F the Federal Circuit has fairly recently considered a bioinformatics type of case in this NRA Board of Trustees of Leyland Stanford Junior University in uh, 2021. And the Federal Circuit uh, unfortunately found the claims uh, unfortunately for Stanford, uh, the claims in the case are ineligible for patent protection. Close read of the opinion reveals insights that if found in a patent application may have resulted in a different outcome. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about some practice tips uh, as well. Next slide, please. So it's a little hard to see, but I just thought it would be useful to look at claim one um, this uh, 982 application is directed to a computerized statistical methods for determining haplotype phase, which is an indication of the parent from whom a gene has been inherited. So the, the concept of haplotype phasing is, just, is a process for determining the parent from whom alleles were inherited. And this particular claim it starts off as a computerized method for inferring haplotype phase in a collection of unrelated individuals. And then the key language that the court looked at um, are the steps that are highlighted. So phases, a set of parameters comprising local recombination rates and mutation rates, where in any change, to the set of imputed haplotype phases in the data structure or automatic results in recomputation of the set of parameters. And then they go through a couple of other steps and end up with storing the at least one final predicted haplotype phase for the individual. And, and that's where the claim ends. And that's important as it'll turn out. Next slide, please. So first, uh, Stanford appealed the examiner's rejection to the Patent and Trade, uh, Patent Trial and Appeal Board, uh, which affirmed the examiner's rejection of ineligibility as an abstract idea. Um, PTAB explained that Stanford had failed to identify any specific disclosures in the specification asserting that claim one results in improved computer functionality. And so part of this is, is the, the timing uh, Right, they, they wrote this application quite a while ago. And so they, they weren't necessarily zeroing in on these kinds of concepts when they drafted the application. Um, Stan Stanford had argued based on a couple of other uh, federal circuit decisions, 
such as this macro case, uh, but uh, the PTAB distinguished those cases because the process used in those earlier cases combined specific rules and a specific order that rendered information into a specific format that's used and applied to create a desired result. Um, in that case, it was a sequence of synchronized animated characters. So the PTAB actually acknowledged that claim one may be useful in medical or population genetic studies, but the claim as written and as, issue, as, as filed and amended was devoid of any specific steps that the claim calculations are integrated into a practical application. As I said, the last step of the claim is just that they're storing the data. Next slide, please. So given that loss, Stanford appealed to the Federal Circuit, which also affirmed the PTAB's decision. Um, and for the same reason that the claims are directed to an abstract idea, so it fails under Section 101, Stanford argued that the claim steps result in a more accurate haplotype prediction. So there, there is one line of argument that one can make that if, if the claim that is supposedly abstract uh, provides some sort of an improvement to either the functioning of the computer or to whatever the particular method is in the field, that that can be a way of getting out of the 101 problem. Um, so Stanford argued that, that it's a more accurate haplotype prediction, but the Federal Circuit pointed out that the written description for the patent application actually said that the mathematical steps, uh, the hidden Markov model, were conventional and well understood. And the application was written in a way, you know, probably to head off other problems with perhaps enablement uh, where they, said that the, that the algorithms were conventional. Um, the other thing is that the Federal Circuit pointed out that some of the arguments that Stanford was trying to make at the appellate level had not been made to the PTAB. And so they were, they were basically, they waived those arguments. And so that was an issue as to how this was argued before both the PTAB and the Federal Circuit. Federal Circuit also explained that the alleged increase in computational accuracy does not qualify as an improvement. It's merely an enhanced abstract calculation. So they made this distinction. I think this is a little bit odd, but they made the distinction between an improvement and an enhancement. And apparently an enhancement is not good enough to get out of the one-on-one -on -one rejection. Next slide, please. So a couple of insights. Um, the PTAB noted that Stanford did not identify specific disclosures in the specification <clears throat> to support their assertion that claim run results in improved computer functionality. Uh, and the Federal Circuit rejected the argument that the claim allegedly made the algorithm more accurate. Um, and so that that's another signal that the specification was written in a way that didn't foresee these kinds of problems. Uh, and finally, and this is a key point, the Federal Circuit pointed out that Claim 1 recites no application, no practical application uh, beyond storing the data. So uh, that's another lesson, right, where the claim could have been drafted in a way to actually do something with the data other than just store it. Next slide, please. So just a couple of key takeaways. When you're drafting a patent application with kind of a heads up to try to survive patent eligibility challenges, a claim should be drafted to capture a practical application of a process that results in an improvement. And you might want to even specifically name that improvement in the claim sometimes. Uh, the specification should be drafted to explain the improvement and you should be really careful about what you say is conventional because I've seen that come back to haunt patent, uh, patent owners in many different scenarios. But you're always treading that fine line between uh, a lack of enablement and then an obviousness rejection or in this case, a one-on-one rejection. So one other point that technological improvements can't just be alleged uh, with attorney argument. 
um, especially if it kind of contradicts that your specification said that the mathematics was conventional. So just something to think about, would the outcome have been different if the specification had des described unconventional processes or mathematical algorithms for achieving the increased accuracy? I, I think that would have been a big help. And also just saying in the, in the spec itself that this improvement was, uh, was achieved, perhaps in the way of examples, uh, comparative examples with uh, the prior art to show uh, the nature and extent of the improvement. Next slide, please. So execution of a computer process on a data structure should be claimed and described in an appropriate level of detail. For example, you want to recite how the process is executed on the data structure, how that creates a formatted data result that improves computer functionality, and you want to draft claims in a manner that brings a process executed to achieve a technological improvement to some conclusion that achieves a practical application. In other words, don't merely generate and store data. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to turn it over to Patrick to talk a little bit more about practice tips for drafting patent applications in light of what may happen during examination or litigation. Next slide. Thanks, Peter. So with respect to, you know, how you're going to draft and prepare your application to survive these Alice landmines, one of the one of the most interesting takeaways I had from the Stanford case is, is that they seem to be more critical of the specification than they were of the claims themselves. And as we saw in the earlier slides, the, the claims were actually quite detailed and um, certainly passed the pencil test. If there's if there's any examiners listening, um, you know, sometimes if you get over that, that pencil length, the examiners will go ahead and push it through. Um, but there was problems with the specification. And, the, and, and, the, and what it appears from my read of, of the cases is that the specification did not describe the technological improvements of the invention. And, and the thing that jumped out at me was how they pointed out the alleged technological improvement. Um, because sometimes you'll see, especially in cases that were drafted pre-ALICE, you can read the specification, you can even look at the claims and understand what the technological improvement would be. Well, one example of this may be, for example, in the search result field. Think of a, a claim that generates search results, but then refines or filters the search results and then provides them to a user. You can argue that there's a technological improvement there in that it you know, reduced the size of the search results before transmitting them therefore requiring less network bandwidth. And if you multiply that over, you know, something like Google that may be providing, you know, millions and millions of search results every minute, it's actually could be a substantial bandwidth improvement. But, you know, and there might be some inventions that might say filtering the search results and then providing the search results. And you can see the technological improvement is there, but if it wasn't described in the application in a way to prove it, and it didn't include, for example, experimental data to show it, the court might just view it as an alleged improvement uh, because the, the work wasn't done up front to describe it properly. So the first practice tip is to effectively use the detailed description um, to explain the claim process um, you know, and explain it properly and with appropriate level of detail and its practical application and technological improvement. Do not leave it undefined so that you you don't fall you know susceptible to these accusations later that this is merely alleged or or hindsight um, you know one of the ways that I do this is that I you know created the drafting routine where I will always put the technological improvement in the first paragraph of the detailed description. My first paragraph of a detailed description is usually a one sentence summary of the entire invention that also captures the technological improvement and practical application. And this provides a number of benefits. I mean, one, you'll never forget it if you make it a routine. Two, you know, you may forget about this application when you when you drafted it and then it doesn't get examined for three years. Um, you can know you can always come back to your application and read the first paragraph of the detailed description and know what is going on. Three, you always have a, at least some support to make these arguments for against Alice rejections later on. And then even another one, you know, you may not be around forever. Um, you may walk out of the office and get hit by a bus, God forbid. 
I mean, if you do, somebody can pick up your patent applications and know what is going on, even without the benefit of a disclosure call. Um, you know, another way you can bolster your specification is to include experimental results when practicable. Um, so for an example, you know, invention of a compression of genomic quality scores, for example, provide bar graphs and experimental data where you ran your algorithm and other compression algorithms that were conventional on the same test data set, describe the test data set and show that your compression algorithm performs better. So for example, show that it has smaller compression sizes, compressed file sizes, faster compression, compression speeds, um, things of that nature. And if you do as many of these things as you can possible, possibly can and you make it routine, um, you, you'll be less likely to, to get you know, your patent invalidated later on or your claims rejected and never allowed um, based on these allegations of technological improvements. Next slide, please. So, you, you know, obviously, even though, you know, the specification is important, so are the claims. So you, you want to think of affecting, effective claim strategy. Um, you know, you want to make sure that these things are captured in the claim as well. So you want to claim your practical application. You want to claim at least one technical improvement. And then ideally, you want to draft your claim in a way that brings to a logical conclusion a final step that hopefully embodies or includes your technological improvement and practical application. So here is just a hypothetical claim for compressing nucleic acid sequence data. And what this hypothetical claim is, is it compresses, you know, it, it performs an initial encoding stage on nucleic acid sequence data and then compresses the, the initial encoding of the data. And the idea being that you know, in this hypothetical example, the input to the compression algorithm is smaller, leading to subsequently smaller compressions and then faster compressions. So here you can see in red, a practical application in the preamble, a method for compressing nucleic acid sequence data. And you can argue that maybe the case in, in, in you know, the claim in the Stanford case had that. Um, but then here we also claim the technical improvement um, is, is that we're, re you know, performing this first encoding to reduce the size of the nucleic acid sequence data before providing it to the compression algorithm, the second encoding process. Um, so this will be your first technical improvement. So you're already above the claims that were at issue in Stanford. And then you, you bring the step to a conclusion using a second encoding process to encode the first encoded data set, thereby compressing the obtained nucleic acid sequence data. So now you have achieved your compression and that compression described by your specification will say that it is faster and smaller because of this initial first encoding step. And if you put those two steps together, you create a very strong case for patent eligibility under 101, and you address virtually all of the deficiencies that were highlighted in the Stanford case. Um, next slide, please. So another creative drafting technique, I think, is to use the drawings to enhance the detailed description. You know, often in computer science space, um, you tend to see block diagrams of system elements. And, you know, just looking at those system elements alone doesn't tell you a whole lot. A and then you might also see applications that have 15 or 20 drawings. And you flip through all the 15 or 20 drawings, you don't know what's going on. You know, you can make a point of practice to try to describe the entire invention in a single figure. And that's what this publication did here. Um, and you know, th this, is, this is an example publication of a genomic compression algorithm. Uh, you can see the input data and the input data has different characteristics that are fed into a classifier. And the classifier then, you know, detects those characteristics and sends it off to different encoding engines, and then the example also shows how the different encoding engines encode it. Now, at first glance, it might not be there, but if you, you know, the, the math works out on all of the conversions and the encodings, and, you know, when you sit down to, to look at it, the entire invention described in one figure, I don't think there's many people that would show that, you know, or, or argue that this is abstract, and that um, when you pair it with your specification support, 
that describes the technological improvement and the claims that claim the practical application technological improvement and, and bring it to a conclusion, you create a very powerful package to argue against the deficiencies that were cited in the Stanford case. Um, next slide, please. So in summary of practice tips gleaned from Stanford, use the detailed description to describe a practical application of the inventive process that achieves a technological solution. Use the detailed description to describe the technological solution achieved. Provide evidence of the technological solution so that the technological solution cannot be cast aside as an alleged technological solution. Um, draft claims that include a practical application, a technological solution, and a series of steps that concludes with a step that achieves the technological solution. Creatively prepare drawings to enhance the technological description of the specification. And one more point on the on the importance of the specification and the type of specification you want to draft is um, the Stanford case also pointed out that Stanford argued that the improvement was increased accuracy in, in, in the mathematical process. But then the Federal Circuit noted that the specification described the mathematics performed as conventional. So it, it, it you know it's another it's another point of practice to consider when drafting your specification to include these details. Make sure you show how your inventive process that has this great technological improvement differs from what's conventionally done. And you know, in the prior examples of these practice tips, you know, we discussed maybe showing experimental results showing how your method performed better than other methods given the same input. That's pretty effective. It's showing, you know, that that you have this unconventional feature but then couple it with the corresponding disclosure. Don't just say we're using a conventional compression algorithm and then say it's better and, and greater and faster and all the others from the, from the prior art. Um, next slide, please. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Peter, who's gonna talk about um, you know, the global aspects of patent prosecution. Um, affectionately titled, It's a Small World. Um, it's also important with these types of inventions to consider, you know, how, how the other patent offices of the world view this subject matter. Go ahead, Peter. Next slide, please. Thanks, Patrick. So it turns out that when we polled a number of patent counsel that we work with closely in, in other countries, that they're, they're basically facing the same kinds of rejections. And there was a lot of commonality in uh, their responses to us. Um, so there, there were, pretty surprisingly similar comments coming from several different countries. So turns out that there's very little or no legal precedent in most of these countries. Uh, in the US, you know, we talked about the Stanford case and interestingly, there's another Stanford case that was decided just uh, a week or two uh, earlier on a related application that came out exactly the same way and so there's not a lot that's very specific on point to bioinformatics and US case law either, but outside the US, it seems to be even less. Um, uh, the, the guidance from the various patent offices also seems to be pretty sparse in these areas of bioinformatics. And it appears that the claims are analyzed in much the same way in, in most of the other countries and where we, where we typically file these kinds of applications. And the other common feature is that it's hard to find an examiner who understands both the biology and the software sides of things. And sometimes these applications end up with a biology examiner and he doesn't really understand the software or vice versa. And that seems to be common in all of the patent offices that we polled. So bottom line is the good news is that I heard from a lot of our foreign associates that the claims that are drafted for US or EP European standards are generally useful in these other countries as well. Next slide, please. So as in the US, the useful claim formats uh, really kind of come down to the same thing. It's a computer implemented method, a computer system, uh, software in a machine readable form that causes a computer to operate in a specific way, a computer program with ex executable code to operate in a particular way. You could talk about modules, libraries, neural networks, uh, 
vector machines and so on, train models. Um, or you could have kind of data structures, information equivalent to a computer program in a, in a machine readable format. Next slide, please. So again, more common issues, uh, generally not patent eligible are computer programs as such or per se. So the program itself, you can't get a patent similar to, to the US. Methods that can be performed in the human mind. So that generally is also viewed as an abstract thing uh, in, in countries outside the US. A known methods executed within a general purpose computer. And that kind of was what, what was at issue in the Alice case. And so that has been adopted around the world as well. Uh, known analytic techniques, such as machine learning applied to data that's organized in a known manner, that's not generally patent eligible. And then uh, different from the US, and this is not specific for bioinformatics, but methods of surgery, treatment, and diagnosis of humans is generally not permitted. And so you can typically get around that by changing the claim format. So patent eligible, on the other hand, inventions in an improvement in a technical field outside of the computer, a computer readable recording medium containing a computer program that causes a computer to execute certain new steps, uh, diagnostic methods using isolated samples that do not involve any kind of clinical determination because that prohibition generally uh, is in place because they want to protect medical doctors from being sued for patent infringement. Uh, and then devices, systems, and compositions that can be used for diagnostic methods are also patentable, even if the methods of treatment or diagnosis are not. Next slide, please. I'm just going to touch on a couple of points uh, uh, from Europe. I'd like to shout out to our Munich office uh, who helped us out on these aspects. But there was a fairly recent and large board decision, the G119 case, that computer implemented inventions cannot be a priori excluded from patent protection. So I thought that was a good general statement in that case. And a claim directed to a computer implemented invention avoids exclusion from patentability by referring to the use of a computer, a computer readable storage medium or other technical means. However, mere possibility of using an unspecified computer for performing a claim method is not sufficient. It doesn't, it doesn't give the technical means or effect that the European examiners are looking for. Um, computer implemented methods that interact with an external physical aspect like they have a specific input or output, may rise to the level of this technical effect that the examiners are looking for. Um, purely numerical methods without an input or output might be okay if you have some sort of a direct link with a physical reality outside of the, uh, outside of the computer. And you wanna be reciting an intended technical use of the data. Next slide, please. In Japan, we got comments from Shiga International. They, they just basically said that patent eligibility can be satisfied if a claimed information processing invention is based on a biological property, for example, a relation between a gene sequence and expression of a trait in a living body. Um, they said it can also be satisfied if a claim recites specific information processing depending on intended use through corroboration of software and hardware elements. And then lastly, they noted that a computer program and its equivalent, such as a neural network, they're, they're intangible objects, but they're deemed under Japanese patent law to be a product and an act of providing a computer program, for example, through the internet, is also deemed to be working of a patented invention. Next slide, please. Uh, in Australia and New Zealand, we got comments from Sprucen and Ferguson, so thank you for that. Um, they, again, pretty similar to other countries, but when an invention lies in an improvement in a technical field outside of the computer, generally considered patent eligible. Um, they highlighted, as Patrick did, it's important to provide details and examples in the application of how the invention is applied and the technical benefits achieved. 
So again, that's where US drafting is helpful in other countries. Um, some of the key aspects that the examiners look for is what actually is the contribution made by the invention beyond the prior art. And the questions that they look for are uh, outlined below. I'll let you read those uh, as we're running towards the end of the hour. Next slide, please. In New Zealand, very similar to Australia, but one key difference is that in Australia and other countries, you need to show some sort of a technical contribution. And uh, for whatever reason, uh, the New Zealand Patent Office does not require uh, a showing that the contribution is technical in nature. Uh, next slide, please. We got comments from Canada by Bereskin and Parr. Um, their uh, claims to known analytic techniques, such as machine learning or otherwise, using data organized in a known or obvious manner, not patentable, not surprisingly. Um, specific organization of data in and of itself is also very difficult to overcome these problems. Uh, claims to correlations between some sort of novel organization of data and a physical attribute, on the other hand, may be patentable. So their tips for success are that the claim should include elements that correspond to a physical item or attribute. So for example, result of a computing process that corresponds to a physical attribute of a living thing, correlation between computed results, and the physical attribute, process that it's exclusively implemented in a computing system, practical and commercial benefits, et cetera. Next slide, please. In China, we had comments uh, from Panawell and Partners, and they listed the, the main statutes uh, that cover methods of diagnosis and treatment of disease, shall not be granted patent rights, and they give the uh, exclusion there where instruments or apparatuses for implementing these methods uh, may be patentable subject matter. And then the claim must contain technical features as, as, as required in other countries, but so claims to an abstract algorithm or pure business rule and method without any technical feature is a mental act, so it's not patentable. Um, on the other hand, claims that contain technical features in addition to features of algorithms or business rules and methods are patentable. And they mentioned in particular that a lot of these bioinformatics will have artificial intelligence aspects and those can be patentable if you have enough of uh, the details uh, relating to specific arrangements of layers or nodes, training methods, learning methods applied to a specific technical field such as image processing, data processing, et cetera. Next slide, please. Uh, in South Korea, we had comments from Kim and Chang. Uh, they had the same abstract idea issue, uh, claims to computer-related inventions can be patented if there is some sort of uh, computer program on a computer-readable medium that causes a computer to execute certain steps. And one tip that they said is that the claims should be uh, either drafted or amended so that each step should clearly indicate execution by hardware to exclude the possibility of doing it by, by hand, by a person. So they want to you know, pepper your claims with computer implemented, used by a server, et cetera. Um, next slide, please. So we're getting close to the end. We have a couple of questions. I don't know, Patrick, if you had a chance to look at the first question having to do with how you can actually find out in litigation what another party is doing. Now, how can you enforce these kinds of method claims? Are you turning that one over to me, Peter? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess th there's a variety of ways. Um, you know, usually marketing materials sometimes, um, you know, maybe product manuals. Maybe you have another claim that is relevant to what the competitor is doing and you initiate a lawsuit based on that and then you can take discovery and you learn a little bit more, right? And then you can then you can amend amend your your complaint to add um patent claims. But um you, you know the, 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 
the, the, I, th I think, you know, there, there was another comment that kind of dovetails with this one um, that was, you know, it seems that you would have to have incredibly narrow claims to get anything allowed. And I'm, I'm, one thing I would just say is I'm not necessarily so sure. And, and I think where they two, the two dovetail together is, is, is that if you draft your claims with a sufficient level of breadth, you may be able to get, you know, you know, proof of infringement or, or, or at least sufficient knowledge of infringement to initiate a lawsuit based on product manuals, marketing materials, um, and, and things of that nature. Um, right. And then you initiate and you initiate the lawsuit, and then maybe you have one or more continuations that claim it in a, at a bigger level of detail um, to refine, you know, as, as you go along. I don't know if Peter, do you have any comments on that or or, or something to add? I, I, yeah, I, I do, but I just want to thank everybody. We're we're at the end of the hour, but if you'd like to take a couple of minutes, uh, you you're you're welcome to stay on the webinar. Uh, those of you who need to drop off, uh, you can feel free to do so. And you can send your questions to us, as I noted. And a replay of the webinar, including the full Q&A session, will be posted on fr.com. Uh, we'll continue answering questions for those who have a few extra moments and would like to stay on. I want to thank everybody for joining us. And please don't hesitate to contact us with any questions. Um, so just in, in terms there, the person was act, asking, well, what do you do if they're not actually selling the software? Um, and, uh, there, there is discovery possible, but I, I agree. It's going to be hard to know exactly what they're doing if they're using the software only internally. But sometimes from the results uh, that they achieve, you can get a sense of maybe what they're doing. There was another question about how much experimental data do you need for support? And there, I would think that, um, if, if you want to do comparative testing, if you have that available, I think that would be uh, really useful uh, because that's going to help in respect to rejection under, under Section 101, but also if you're facing any kind of prior art rejection. And in terms of you know how much more do you need, if you don't have comparative testing, you still want to show how well your particular method or system works uh, to achieve its intended benefit. Patrick, I don't know, do you have any other thoughts on how much uh, you want to put in in terms of experimental data? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it has to be overly excessive. Um, I usually reserve, you know, where the data is available and can be generated, um, maybe like a figure with a graph and maybe a few paragraphs describing the figure. Um, my background comes from the computer science side of things. I've also seen things on the on the, you know applications on the life sciences side of of things that may may have a, a lot more appendixes and appendixes of experimental data. It, for these types of inventions, I don't necessarily think that is always required, but I think you do need some data, and I would try to get at least one you know chart of data summarizing the data um, and a few paragraphs of, of description of that data um, th that can drive the point home that there is some some benefit and, and believe it or not that will probably set you set you apart from a, a, a lot of other a lot of other applications so we just got a question in well can you make a case of providing technological advancement advancements without the support of experimental data and I guess you can just allege it in your specification, but during examination, the examiner may say, well, I, I, I don't see how you can get this level of improvement. It just seems incredible. And so during prosecution, you may be able to introduce that kind of comparative testing that's not in the application. Um, that works pretty well in the US. You can submit a declaration that provides the data. But outside the U.S., for example, in China, Japan, uh, South Korea, very difficult, if not impossible, to introduce that kind of data. If it's not in the application as of the filing date uh, of your, let's say you start with a PCT application, if it's not there, then examiners in those countries are not going to accept any kind of new data being added during prosecution. Yeah, and and I would just piggyback on that 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 I think you absolutely can 
get these applications allowed and, and upheld without experimental data. I think the fact that you just describe it in the specification, you know, the technological improvement, you know, takes you a step beyond the alleged the alleged improvement of Stanford because, you know, it, it's interesting that they said multiple times that they didn't identify any improvement in their spec. So this seems to be, you know, an idea of a technological improvement that came after the specification was drafted in order to maybe address a deficiency. Um, so, you know, I think if you if you at least explain in your specification, the technological improvement is the base case is very helpful. And, um, you, you know, I would doubt that at the examination stage, an examiner would, would, would question your, you know, your technological improvement, and then maybe it would, maybe perhaps it could be litigated, um, but then you may also have the chance to show, you know, why those statements were made and that they were credible. Um, I think, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's definitely a leg up to have those statements and explanation there and prove that they were correct and, and also make somebody disprove them, right? If you're at litigation and, try and says, paragraph 65 of my specification says the technological improvement is this, and then you have, you know, entered into the litigation, your data that showed why you made those statements and why they were credible, I think then, you know, the other side is going to have to show that they're not. And, um, you know, that definitely gives you a leg up um, versus having no technological improvement in your specification at all, which is what happened in the Stanford case. So I'll address one more question. Someone asked, what is the clue that a particular bioinformatics invention is better kept as a trade secret? And to me, it really depends on how you're using that that software, uh, wh who are your competitors, what are they doing? Because a trade secret is great, it keeps the world from knowing what you're doing, but in order to assert a trade secret in litigation against a competitor, you'd have to prove that they actually took the idea from you. And if they came up with an innovation that's very similar to yours on their own, uh, without taking anything from you or your employees, then it, it is impossible to assert that trade secret against them. And then they can, they can proceed. Also, a, a trade secret uh, keeps it secret. And so you're not creating prior art against anyone else either. So you're not able to prevent your competitor from getting a patent on whatever they've developed that happens to be very similar to yours. And then all, all of a sudden, you may be in a situation where you're infringing their, their patent, even though you've been doing something for years, but you kept it from the world. So a, a lot of competing uh, interests and factors to consider, but in certain situations, it, it is useful uh, to protect software as a, as a trade secret. Otherwise, I think we'll wrap it up for today. And once again, thank you for everyone who is still uh, listening. Thank you for joining us. And you'll uh, be getting a, a follow-up email with uh, a copy of or a link to a replay of this. And I believe that the materials will be also distributed as, as a PDF. Thank you very much and have a good rest of the day.